Motions regulations. There will be a single debate on both motions. I will ask the, the clerk to read the first motion, then call the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on both motions. When all who wish to speak have done so, I shall put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record and I will call the minister to move it. The question then will be put on that motion. If that's clear enough, then we shall proceed and I'll ask the clerk to read the first motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 7 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. I call the Junior Minister Gordon Lyons to move the motion. Beg to move. Thank you, Minister. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate and I call the Junior Minister to open the debate on the motion. Gordon Lyons. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. There are two motions before the Assembly today, and with your permission, I will address both of these in my remarks. I will begin by outlining for members the changes brought about by these regulations and the reasons behind the Executive's decisions. Firstly, the Amendment No. 7 regulations amended Regulation 5 to allow an additional circumstance where people could leave their home to visit another person's dwelling, either alone or accompanied by others, provided the maximum number of persons in the dwelling is no more than six. The executive considered this easement would make provision for informal childcare arrangements between families and friends to resume. And I know it has been much welcomed by many people, especially grandparents who had previously been unable to have contact with grandchildren. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, just before I outline the further changes to the regulations brought about by Amendment No. 8. Let me remind members that while the approach of the Executive has not been to take decisions based on a timetable, we have recognised that some sectors benefit from future indicative dates. This means our decisions are taken on the basis that sectors and citizens will have the information they need, including some indicative dates, guidance where necessary and strong messaging. With that in mind, the Executive gave advance notice to people and relevant sectors of the dates from which they could resume their activities and operations. The following then are the regulatory changes made to give effect to those dates. The Executive agreed to amend Regulation 3 and Schedule 2 to allow businesses such as hotels, restaurants, cafes, bars and coffee shops to reopen from the, second, from the 3rd of July, subject to certain restrictions relating to the serving of alcohol. The Executive considered that this relaxation would assist in allowing people to leave their home, improving well-being and increasing the sense of normality, as well as restoring the livelihoods of those employed in the sector. The Executive also agreed to further amend Regulation 4 to allow holiday accommodation such as caravan parks to open from the 26th of June, to allow people to travel to a second home and to allow visitor attractions such as historic houses, culture and heritage centres and outdoor attractions to open from the 3rd of July. These relaxations will provide significant economic benefits for the tourism and hospitality sector. And it will also allow people to take much needed leisure breaks after the difficult restrictions that we have all been living under since late March. We have been pleased that representative bodies from the food and drink sector including UK Hospitality, the Northern Ireland Hotel Federation and Hospitality Ulster have worked closely with the Department for the Economy, the Public Health Agency and the Health and Safety Executive to produce timely and appropriate guidance to enable these businesses to reopen. The Executive agreed to further amend Regulation 3 to allow premises used as indoor sports facilities to open for the purpose of training undertaken by Aletha elite athletes. The executive recognised the comprehensive protocols that sporting bodies have in mind to allow this. The executive also agreed to amend Regulation 4 to allow places of worship to hold religious services other than baptism services or certain wedding services and Bible readings from the 29th of June. Junior Minister Kearney and I had very positive meetings with church leaders to agree the guidelines that churches would adopt to allow for services to recommence. The Executive agreed to amend Regulation 5 and Schedule 2 to allow nail, hair, beauty, barbers, tanning salons, 
electrolysis and acupunct acupuncture businesses to reopen from the 6th of July. I know that this is a relaxation that has been particularly welcomed by members who have participated in all of our debates to date. In previous debates, members had also raised concerns about the time lag between the executive making decisions and the opportunity for the Assembly to hear and debate those. I'm taking the opportunity today then to update the, the Assembly on decisions made last week. Last Monday, we agreed that the number of people attending outdoor gatherings was to be increased from 10 to 30. And then on Thursday last, we agreed to give legislative effect to allow a range of activities and sectors to restart, including the reopening of museums and galleries from the 3rd of July, the reopening of bookmaking offices from the 3rd of July, the reopening of close contact services, massage, tattooing and piercing, and spas, though not thermal treatments, from the 6th of July, and the restricted reopening of restaurants and bars and private members' clubs from the 3rd of July. As we reduce the degree of regulation, uh, then it is guidance and adherence to that guidance that will become more and more important. We cannot defeat COVID-19 with fines and penalties alone. The choices that each of us make will determine the outcome. Mr. P Principal Deputy Speaker, as I close, it would be remiss of me not to mention the issue and importance of compliance with these regulations. The events of the last week are well rehearsed and will no doubt be a matter of further debate today. But I do, first of all, want to recognise the pain that many people feel at this time. We have all made sacrifices over the last number of months because we wanted to comply with the regulations, with the rules that had been put in place for the simple purpose of saving lives. And I know that people are angry. They are angry that the rules have been broken. They are angry that there was a denial that the rules were broken. They are angry that when they then highlight these issues, they're accused of making party political uh, points. They're angry at the lack of remorse. And they're also angry at themselves for having kept the rules when others have not. And I know that there are many families who saw what happened last week and asked themselves why they went to the lengths that they went to when others then broke the rules. And I have had people, families coming to me saying that they feel like mugs because of it. I've been contacted by one family in my constituency and they asked that I would share their story. Thomas McFarlane died during this period of, of restrictions and his family told me of the lengths that they went to to comply with the regulations. That included bringing his grandson home from Scotland and his grandson stayed in the family's garage so that they would comply with the rules. They did not get to grieve as they wanted, and Thomas McFarlane did not get the funeral that he deserved. Now, his name may not be familiar to everybody here, but I think most people have probably seen a picture of him. And that picture was taken as he was led away from the scene of the Abercorn bombing in 1972, guided by two ladies as the blood poured down his face. He suffered from a post-traumatic stress disorder for the rest of his life. His family shared in that suffering and they felt that the funeral last week and their inability to have one as they would have liked was one final kick in the teeth from the Republican movement. So Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I understand the anger that are felt by many who say to me that it appears that all funerals are equal but some funerals are more equal than others. And so how do we respond to that today? Well, let me say, first of all, that although the credibility of some of the messengers 
may have been damaged, the credibility of the message remains unchanged. These regulations are still required, they are still necessary, and we still need to adhere to them. Secondly, let me say this, that two wrongs do not make a right. And can I urge people over the next number of days, especially those from, from my community, can I say to them, please stick to the regulations, adhere to them. Do not let those who organized the funeral last week be the yardstick by which we measure ourselves. Just because others have broken the rules, don't think that their irresponsibility gives us the license to do the same thing. Let's make sure that we keep the rules, not just for the sake of keeping them, but so that we can protect the health and the lives of people here. Can I also say to those that have adhered to the rules, please don't regret the fact that you have done so. Your sacrifice was worth it. It was not for nothing, and it probably saved lives. And let me be very clear, your loved one was not worth less than anybody else. Your grief is no less than anybody else. And we want to thank them for sticking by the rules and doing what was required of them. I urge others to do the same, and I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you. Thank the uh, Minister. Um, before I commence this debate, um, I would remind members, insofar as is possible, if they could direct their comments to the content of the regulations that the Minister was referring to. I would also remind members that tomorrow a motion will be debated, which stands actually in, in my name along the, alongside the name of Ms Kelly Armstrong, Dr Steve Aiken and Mr Colin McGrath. So there will be ample opportunity, and I just want to impress upon the House, without trying to restrict debate in any which way, to try and direct remarks to the regulations that the Minister was referring to. The first person I'm going to call in this debate is the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr Colin McGrath. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I rise to speak on behalf of the Committee uh, for the Executive Office. As I have said during every debate on these amendment regulations, the Committee welcomes the lifting uh, of the restrictions when the time is right. The First Minister and Deputy First Minister attended our committee meeting on Wednesday past and provided an update on the Executive's response to the pandemic. The committee was concerned about the wider health, societal and economic impacts of the regulations and the significant and serious implications the crisis has had on all sectors of our community and the economy. Members were therefore pleased to hear that a process to develop an executive strategy for recovery has begun. It is clear, though, that for the strategy to be effective, we need constructive collaboration between departments, local government, the private and community and voluntary sectors. No one can work in isolation. We have a long road ahead of us, but the road is worth travelling if it leads to effective health, economic and full recovery. On the face of things, it looks as if we're moving fast towards normality. We can go back out for a meal, we can get a haircut later today, and we can go out to the museums. But it is important to emphasize that things are not normal. A pandemic situation is not the norm. We might be able to do all of the things that the junior minister has outlined, but we must do them responsibly, whilst observing social distancing guidelines and washing our hands frequently. The evidence is showing us that the community transmission rate is now as low as it's going to get in the absence of a vaccine. But for that situation to continue, everyone must continue to show discipline and be compliant. I'd like to make one or two remarks as an STLP MLA, and I, I thank the Minister for uh, his report this morning. I, I see you're now prompting mo much of the questions that we're going to ask and many of the remarks, so that allows my remarks to be somewhat shorter. And I welcome the continued relaxation of the regulations, safe in the knowledge that you are uh, introducing them after consulting with our scientific community and the leading experts. Um, it would be, of course, amiss 
uh, of one not to ask and encourage the community of the North to do their level best and stick to the regulations and stick to the guidelines. It is fairly obvious that some in this place think that these regulations that we pass here do not apply to them. And I want to send a clear and unequivocal message that these regulations apply to everyone. We all must do what we can. It is unfortunate that those in positions of responsibility have chose to be lax in their approach to these regulations. That has caused difficulties. That has caused confusion. It doesn't make these journeys that we all must make any easier. And I commend people who have stuck with the rules, made the sacrifices and borne the scars of the impact of these regulations. Thank you. Thank you for making that sacrifice. You have helped to stop the spread of this virus. You have helped to save lives. You know where your loyalties lie. It lies to all of us in our community and not the narrow constituency of your mates. This is going to be a long journey. There will be no quick and easy solution until we see a vaccine. The relaxation of these regulations does not mean an immediate return to business as usual. It is a move into a new way, which we all must adopt immediately so that we can save lives, stop the spread of the virus, and continue with our lives as best we can in a common effort and with a common purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr. Colin Gildernew. Thank you, Mr. John Corlea, and I wish to update the House on the Health Committee's consideration of the latest amendments to the regulations. Once again, I would like to acknowledge the enormous work being done by all those working to protect public health and manage the ongoing risks and challenges presented by the pandemic. It is clear from a range of sources that continued vigilance is essential. The committee was briefed on amendment number seven and amendment number eight last Tuesday, the 30th of June. The Chief Environmental Health Officer advised of the main easements for each as outlined by the junior minister. In relation to small groups being able to meet indoors under amendment seven and the broader suite of easements provided for by amendment eight, members reflected their ongoing desire to have a better sense of the scientific evidence informing decisions. The committee is awaiting a reply to correspondence to the department on this matter, and the view was expressed that the committee should be provided with relevant evidence assessing the safety of the easements before being asked to give support to relevant regulations. The committee returned to the issue of enforcement raised in relation to previous amendments and was advised that the regulations had now been amended in such a way as not to require an amendment to the enforcement provisions on each occasion. Such is the pace with which changes are being made and considered in the Chamber that the examiner of statutory rules had not had a chance to report on the regulations amendment number eight prior to the committee's consideration since they had only been laid a few days earlier. The committee therefore agreed to support both SRs subject to the examiner's report. The examiner reported on Friday and highlighted an issue for clarification in amendment number eight around reference to places of worship being able to open for purposes including Bible readings, and whether it was intended that the regulations should facilitate all faith communities in holding services involving readings from other sacred texts. Her report advises that the Department of Health has indicated that the regulations do not fully reflect its policy intent and that it will bring a corrective amendment shortly, and I hope the junior minister will provide an assurance on this point in his winding remarks. The committee has not had a chance to consider the examiner's report, but I hope this information assists members today in coming to a conclusion. Thank you. I call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, for many debates here, we've been talking about what have been significant, but maybe smaller steps in the easing of lockdown to what we do today. We do not underestimate the necessity of each move, but I think it is worth noting that changes to the regulations we have here are probably representative of our biggest step forward. And I'm sure many of us can say that we have never known so many people own caravans before lockdown kicked in. And, and I know from messages and emails received over the last period of days and weeks that the move to open, reopen these um, very much 
loved escapes is very welcome. Our tourism and hospitality sector have been particularly hit by the lockdown period, so it is very welcome that we now see our bars, restaurants, cafes and hotels once again open their doors. We have a fantastic industry here and it is in desperate need of public support and I really would encourage the public to um, get out there and spend their money in their local neighbourhoods. With the one metre social distancing, turnover sits at 70% and that's hugely challenging and does not reflect an environment where a living can be made and out, uh, and out of hope has to be what we continue on the pathway to normality and further restrictions we hope can be um, implemented um, in terms of easements that will help these businesses going forward. Family life has also been hugely impacted upon and the indoor gathering provisions is very welcome. It allows children to see Granny and Granda and I know that has been so keenly anticipated and now enjoyed by many. I often think on high lockdown has impacted on the minds of our young people and it is bound to have brought so many questions, the changes to normal routines and, and activities and I do think it's something we need to be cognizant of moving forward. The last area I wish to mention is in the reopening of places of worship and faith is fundamental to how many people in Northern Ireland um, live their lives and the act of public worship is a key part of that, it's not an optional extra for them. And I know many congregations and church leadership teams struggled to level the idea of closing churches with their beliefs. Public faced with such significant threat to their health of their congregations did the right thing and closed their doors. I want to commend so many churches for the innovative ways that they have adapted through online services and also to folk like Colin Tinsley who have uh, school assembly and Bible clubs for kids available. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to uh, once again commend all the people in Northern Ireland who have adhered to the regulations and guidance to allow these restrictions to be eased. It is not easy, it is difficult and many people have had to do very difficult things to get us to this point. I think that is why the recent actions of so many from across me in this chamber on the Sinn Féin benches are so shameful. No respect for the regulations, the wider public or our frontline healthcare workers. No integrity to actually front up and tell the truth, and the Sinn Féin version of equality. Supremacy, arrogance and entitlement. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I beg the public not to weaken their resolve in the face of the reckless actions of some so-called leaders. We have come so far, let's not ruin it now. Thank you. Mr Doug Beattie. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, this is Amendment 7 and 8 of, I think, uh, 10 amendments so far, but I'm sure there's going to be uh, an awful lot more um, to this coronavirus legislation. Um, I, I've not spoken before uh, on this, and I haven't spoken before because uh, I support our executive uh, and I support uh, our executive office. I trust them uh, when they asked us to adhere to this regulations. Uh, I'm not sure I can still say that anymore. Uh, I'm not sure I can even support this bill anymore. This legislation was the most draconian, far-reaching possible, and these amendments ease the restrictions, but they don't take the restrictions away. They just give more guidelines and more restrictions, which everybody has to uh, adhere to. And it's a drip, drip um, feed of, of, of getting us out of unlock, and it's the right way to do it if we all abide by it. Because we have to understand what we did as an executive and assembly nearly four months ago, those difficult decisions that we made in an attempt to protect the health of our citizens from the effects of COVID-19, we have damaged the health of our citizens. Mental health, already at crisis level, is now at epidemic level. Amendment 7 aims to attempt to address that. In an attempt to protect our economy with furlough, grants, support measures, all needed, all welcome, we have damaged our economy. Small and medium businesses are finding it extremely difficult to take root, with the, even with these amendments, and some may never open again. And Amendment 8 aims to deal with that. In order to save lives due to the pandemic, we have cost lives. 
Because as we close down services, people with cancer and other illnesses have succumbed to the ravages on their bodies and have passed away. We did that, this executive, this assembly. In order to protect all our citizens, young and old, sick and healthy, working class, middle class, Catholics, Protestants, neither, foreign nationals, visitors, key workers, the furloughed, the shielding, the people frightened by a pandemic that already cost them dearly, we curtailed people's civil, civil liberties. We allowed the sick to die scared and alone. We stopped people from mourning and going with their families on that final journey that is so important in our culture here on this island. People accepted those hardships with grace, with sorrow and with understanding. They lost moments they will never get back. Yet Sinn Féin drove a, course, a coach and horses through that, through that sacrifice with an act of selflessness, arrogance and pure privilege. Words cannot express how angry and sad I am today. And many people out in our society are angry and sad at what has happened. Through the actions of Sinn Féin, you have trampled all over the hurt, the pain and the sacrifice of this society and you do not have the good grace to stand up and say sorry for doing so and make amends for it. The hard facts are that our executive and this assembly grappled with these restrictions over the last four months and I know from my colleague, uh, the health minister, Robin Swan, this weighed heavily on him as he had to make life and death decisions. But look at us now. What a sorry bunch we are. Because all of what we said, all of what we told this society to do, pleaded with them to do, has now been undermined. Everything, everything we say now has been undermined. And it's been undermined by a Deputy First Minister who simply does not care. Point of order for Mr John O'Dowd. I, I believe you made a ruling at the start of the debate um, in regards uh, this legislation that's going through the House today and there is an opportunity for members to debate uh, their concerns etc in a debate tomorrow uh, so perhaps you'd like to make that ruling. Um, I don't think I made a ruling to be fair I think what I said was that I think it's important that members relate their comments to the content of the regulations. In his introductory remarks I think um, the junior minister addressed some of the issues that Mr Beattie is now addressing, but I would reiterate there is an opportunity tomorrow. Uh, a motion has been tabled and there will be an opportunity for a thorough discussion of those events tomorrow. If I could please encourage all members to direct their comments to the content of the regulations that are being amended. Mr Beattie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll acknowledge uh, what Mr. O'Dowd has said. And, and uh, fair enough, I, I can understand what you're doing because um, you're trying to protect your um, uh, Deputy First Minister uh, and maybe even some of your ministers who also broke those regulations and maybe some of your MLAs. But if we want to relate this to what we're talking about here uh, and we look at Amendment 7, with no more than six uh, in a house, well, what about the 45? all in a building crammed in together with no social distancing, um, with a MLA from his party posing beside them. A clear breach of Amendment 7. You know, so we can relate to all of these. The problem is, as we drip feed these changes, if we don't adhere to them, it's an absolutely pointless thing to do. It undermines the executive's credibility. It means they've lost integrity. It means they've lost moral authority. It means that us sitting here, if we try and ignore this, when we're looking at these amendments and we're asking people to adhere to them, and we're, remember what we said? We're on 10 now, maybe going on to 12. What we're really saying to people is, you have to do that. But you know what? We don't. 
And yes, we may have a debate about this tomorrow. That's for tomorrow. I'm talking about these amendments today. And the question is quite simple. Will Sinn Féin address the MLA who was in a room with 40 to 50 guys dressed in black and white with no social distancing, breaching the Amendment 7? If the answer is no, you have no credibility. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party. My colleague Kelly Armstrong will be addressing the wider issues tomorrow during the debate. Um, for many in our society, the changes brought forward in Amendments 7 and 8 have brought us closer to a return to normality and resumption of activities that bring joy and amusement. If we turn to Amendment 7 to amend Regulation 5, allowing people to visit others in their home, this has undoubtedly brought untold joy to people from all walks of life, but especially, as Mr Lyons pointed out, those grandparents who have had to learn to use electronic devices to engage with their treasured grandchildren during this pandemic. And so when we saw the photographs of recent family reunions, we are all reminded of the purpose of the lockdown restrictions, staying apart so that we can re reunite in the future. I don't think any of us will take for granted again that quick pop in for a coffee with a loved one. Those chats and connections are so valuable to our sense of community and belonging. And no doubt will, will go some way to easing some of the poor mental health and wellbeing issues that many of our constituents have experienced during this period of prolonged isolation. As we turn to Amendment 8 and the opening up again with mitigations of our restaurants and bars, our hair salons and beauty bars and visitor attractions, we must remember how difficult this process has been for those businesses. And I reference in particular those small operators with a few staff just pursuing their passion by going it alone in enterprise and who have faced the most horrendous financial circumstances over the last few months. We will all have received those very distressing phone calls and emails from constituents who needed answers to questions about the status of grants because they needed to ensure that their staff with their own bills got paid in time. Because let us not forget that while financial measures were brought forward by the UK government and our own executive ministers, there were still delays in these payments and were still there were many who were not eligible and have been forced to take the decision to close their business as a result of the COVID-19 lockdown. And as Mr Beatty just pointed out as well, we know of many who will sadly not be reopening this month. And so moving forward, we must bear in mind from small cafes to hairdressers that the current, with the current restrictions, many are still left with much uncertainty as to whether they will survive. And so during the coming weeks and months, we continue to need to balance the need for effective and clear public health guidance and advice with not placing on these businesses unnecessary pressures to allow them to continue, sorry, to open their doors, to continue to provide a service to their local community and to provide opportunities for employment. The other group of people, therefore, of um, high importance to these regulatory changes are those staff who will be looking, um, who will be working in our visitor attractions and our nail salons, etc. We need to give them the confidence that the lifting of these lockdown restrictions have been taken with clear evidence and careful thinking. I hope that the decision by the Executive to support the Infrastructure Minister's request to make the wearing of masks on public transport, with some exceptions, that, that will give them the extra confidence um, when they're returning to, um, week, coming to, sorry, returning to work in the coming weeks and months to, to use our trains and buses. Further to this, the childcare um, needs of some of our returning workers must not be forget, forgotten. We know, obviously, with Amendment 7 that grandparents can begin to be an option again for that, but there are still many who, who will not have full childcare cover. A reminder of how interlinked our society is and our important role in this legislature in ensuring that when we make the amendments to these health protection regulations, we reflect on the full consequences of these announcements. And as such, I would repeat my support for Mr McGrath's suggestion last week that when we do get these announcements of the easements from the Executive Office, that we are given an opportunity in this chamber to ask questions of the junior ministers around what that means in practice for our constituents when they'll be receiving updated guidance and advice. So in closing, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I would ask the public, as they return to our hospitality and beauty, businesses and visiting their loved ones, that they are ever mindful of the need to be vigilant and careful, 
None of us in this chamber wants to see a second spike in cases and more deaths and illness and misery. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, I suppose, as I say on all these occasions, uh, when we speak on these particular issues, uh, under normal circumstances, this would be very draconian legislation uh, that I'm sure most of us in this House would not support. But given the current crisis that we're in uh, with the pandemic, it was essential that these uh, regulations were brought in when they were brought in. And as it turns out, we were uh, very much ahead of the curve uh, in terms of what was happening across the water. Uh, and I suppose um, the regulations that are being amended here today, or that have been amended and that we're debating today, uh, Amendment Number 7, is particularly welcome in terms of uh, visiting other houses now, and it opens the door again for uh, grandchildren to visit their grandparents and for grandparents to take up the role that many of them do in terms of childcare. Uh, so that, that's very welcome and, and, and it's, it, it's very welcome in general that the restrictions are being eased and of course uh, the amendment number eight relates to the uh, easing of restrictions uh, in terms of reopening of various business, businesses, hotels, bars, restaurants, cafes, coffee bars, indoor training facilities, places of worship, visitor attraction, and, and the ability of people to go and uh, stay in their second homes. Uh, and also um, hairdressers, barbers, beauty salons, uh, uh, and so on. And although the restrictions are being eased, there are still going to be major problems, particularly for small businesses. My, my wife won't readily uh, forgive me for telling you here today that she was at the beauticians at 8 o'clock this morning uh, for the first appointment uh, because she, she goes away tomorrow. Uh, and um, the beautician had on the full face visor, uh, apron, gloves, uh, the whole shebang. Uh, and she told my wife that she would be working until nine o'clock tonight. And that, it's very welcome, of course, that people can get back to work. But by the time she was finished with my wife, uh, the sweat was pouring out of her. Uh, the amount of PPE uh, she was uh, having to wear uh, was very awkward. Um, it, uh, in, in the heat of the salon itself, uh, it makes it very uncomfortable very uncomfortable working conditions for anyone to work in. Uh, and she actually said to my wife, if this continues, I'll be out in the second two weeks time. So, and, and, and we all know the various problems that are going to be faced by other uh, businesses as well. Um, the, we know of course there's a time lag in us debating these uh, amend, amended regulations that have already come into effect. Uh, and on the 29th of June, the, uh, another of the regulations was amended to increase the number of people attending outdoor events uh, from 10 to 30. So I suppose uh, in general, a free last kyun korla, all of these issues are, are, are welcome. The easing of restrictions is welcome. But I heard the First Minister on the radio this morning uh, saying that the R rate had risen above one in London. And that's, that, that's very concerning. And as the easing of these, as the easing... Sorry, Mr. Sheen, just one moment. It is not in order to heckle another member when they're on their feet. Um, we don't do that in this house. We should treat each other with respect. Mr. Sheen. I've got a free last question called uh, the member in question regularly heckles, so uh, it's, it's water off a duck's back to me. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's concerning that the R rate has risen uh, again in London, and of course we all know about the lockdown in Leicester and in other places. And as there continues to be an easing of the restrictions, uh, we, we need to be careful. Uh, in, in the last debate we had here, uh, the... Uh, Junior Minister Lands 
uh, raised the fact that I had mentioned the wearing of face masks. Uh, and uh, I welcome the fact that it, that has been introduced in public transport. Um, uh, but the point I had made during that debate was that the chief scientific officer had said that uh, he was concerned when he went into his shop and found he was the only one wearing a face mask. And by coincidence, he was on Radio Ulster shortly after our last debate. And uh, in his interview, he stated that the wearing of face masks would significantly, significantly reduce the transmission of the virus. And that's probably another area that the executive uh, needs to look at. So I welcome uh, the relaxation of the restrictions, and I leave it there, Gurmagad. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, like my, my colleague Doug Bidius, this is the first time I've spoken on uh, the regulations, and, um, and, and looking through them, there are, uh, the, the import has already been made by many members with regard to the implications that the easements are going to have, and I do uh, welcome them. These are not normal times, and, and they're certainly not, uh, this is not uh, normal legislation, and the regulations have been described as being draconian, and that's hope that we never have to revisit them again. Um, I want to take the opportunity, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, to congratulate uh, uh, the majority of the wider community, businesses, community and voluntary sector, and in particular statutory services, um, who have had to look at these amendments, these regulations, and alter how they provide their services, how they keep us safe, um, and how they serve us. Um, in respect of the amendments, in particular uh, Amendment Number 7, we will all welcome the easement. The, the ability to spend time with each other uh, in, in someone else's home is really, really welcome. That's the case for many, many reasons. There are many social reasons for that. Um, but as we have talked about at length uh, since I became an MLA, particularly in around mental health, and we, can, we cannot waste an opportunity to not raise it as the most significant issue, even at a time such as COVID. And in fact, uh, what COVID has actually done, it has potentially magnified what was already uh, a pandemic and a crisis that we had here in Northern Ireland. It has certainly stimmied the ability of the health service and those health professionals who work in mental health from doing the best that they can, and it has forced them into uh, unique challenges with, for instance, face-to-face -face counselling or the ability to interact on that very personal basis. Because what you lose when you're spending time with somebody is picking up on the little cues that you get that words don't give, whether it's the wink of an eye or the nod of a head or whether it's a fidget, whether it's a nervousness. So in, with the ability, with the easing of these amendments and the ability to have that social interaction again, we would welcome that. Um, I think it's um, Sinead Bradley, the SDLP MLA, who heads up the, the old party group on social uh, isolation. And that is something that is re really gaining momentum. And the ability for families to, to, to socially integrate again is really important. However, we cannot forget that we still have the post, or sorry, the pre-COVID crisis of mental health that existed before COVID. It wasn't COVID that caused it. We have problems here which are, which are decades old, which I think we are collegiately uh, likely trying to, to fix. But COVID has magnified that. And we look at all of the implications of COVID and some of those things we will talk about tomorrow because COVID has brought death uh, to the door of many. It has brought death, whether it's through COVID or whether it's through the lack of uh, services. But that mental health impact is going to be felt for generations. It is something that we're going to have to deal with. It is something that we're going to have to collectively adjust and be honest about, about what we did or what we didn't do at this time. The inability to grieve over a time like now, uh, I don't think you can, you can learn out of a book, you can be fixed out of a book. It's going to take time and it's going to take the rebuilding of confidence. And I welcome the easing of uh, the regulation under amendment uh, number seven. And if I look just briefly, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, on amendment uh, number eight, it is good to see feet on the ground in our, in our uh, town centres once again. Um, it is remarkable to see the lengths that have had to be been taken to provide the social distancing in shops, outside shops, weather dependent, and obviously this last few days haven't been kind. But there has been a great financial impact 
on our shops. And whilst the intervention of the British government uh, has been very welcome and gratefully accepted, the ability to trade on in the weeks and months to come, I think we need to discuss now. So the easement that we are seeing here, which allows our shoppers to go back um, and shop local, is really, really important because our local shops underpin, underpin our employment opportunities for the people who live in our community. So it is really vital that we encourage people to shop locally but safely. And we see the adherence to the regulations, but you do see that footfall. I, I, was, I was reading recently of the, the, the richest people in the UK, Jeff Bezos. I'm not sure if he's the number one richest guy, but the owner of Amazon was not impacted by COVID. I would actually go as far as to say that there were people who financially benefited to, to, to extraordinary measures that we would not enjoy here. And we need to see that our legislation marks time with our businesses, marks time with our health, to ensure that the, the people do return with confidence uh, to support the businesses which underpin Northern Ireland PLC. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I welcome the amendment. I call Mr. John Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise uh, to, to, to address some specifics and outworkings of the regulations of the amendments. But before I do that, I'd like to thank the, the Minister for the statement. I welcome the amendments, which assist, of course, in restarting the economy, but also, very importantly, give signs of recovery and reassurance to those who have patiently adhered to the regulations in the interests of public health. Um, as others have done previously today, I too would like to pay tribute to those in Northern Ireland from all communities, Principal Deputy Speaker, for their efforts in battling coronavirus and keeping themselves and others safe. Today, though, as I indicated there at the start, I would like to address the fact that it is extremely difficult to apply a one-size-fits-all approach to some aspects of recovery. And I wish in particular to draw attention to specific needs in our rural areas in Northern Ireland. Whilst efforts to roll out Pavement Cafe and other initiatives in city and urban areas are very welcome, we need to address the reality that this will not fit every street or every small town or village across Northern Ireland. And I raise this, Principal Deputy Speaker, not to negate the value of the excellent initiatives that have come forward, but to point out simply that different approaches and different priorities will be required in different places. Bars, restaurants and hotels in rural areas may need wider consideration than simply the use of pavement areas. And there are often at, at these uh, locations outdoor areas with an open or semi-open aspect outbuildings at these businesses which could be utilised further if there is a desire to, to do so. I need hardly point out that the rural economy and local jobs rely heavily on these businesses restarting uh, successfully and sustainably. I am pleased to hear that in recent days an interagency group has been set up led by the Department of Communities and it seems that will look at how recovery will be best accommodated within remaining coronavirus regulations. It is my hope, Principal Deputy Speaker, that other departments will join with communities at Lucan, um, not just across the departments, but across all of the localities in Northern Ireland also. Hopefully, flexibilities and temporary arrangements could be considered by the working group for a range of businesses and areas, bearing in mind the differences in local settings and opportunities available. These are likely to involve uh, some, at least temporary, reconsiderations of planning and licensing matters. It would be reassuring, Principal Deputy Speaker, to know that the Executive and the Executive Office will consider these specific needs and challenges in rural areas as they take this forward. And hopefully the junior minister can reflect that when he responds. Mr. Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, I certainly uh, welcome uh, the relaxations uh, of these regulations uh, contained in Amendments 7 and 8. I must say I had some personal concerns around the uh, amendment date, uh, the opening of, of certain uh, premises where food and drink was to be consumed. But I have to say that the hospitality industry uh, certainly have uh, risen to the challenge over the weekend. Uh, and I don't really think that we could find uh, any fault with how they have uh, approached their responsibilities uh, towards keeping people safe. I think that we have to recognise that um, 
These relaxations, uh, welcome as they are, they're only part of the road back to normality, uh, and they're only part of a journey. We're certainly not there yet. This pandemic is still claiming lives, it's still making people ill, it's still causing families misery, and I think we can't lose sight of that. The message still is very much around social distancing, uh, and it's around uh, still washing your hands, the simple things that we've been told, the messages that have been getting preached over recent months still very much apply. And if we are serious about protecting public health, we all have to continue to buy in uh, to uh, those, uh, gui that guidance and those restrictions. And you know, we've all, as other speakers have said, we've all made sacrifices uh, because of the introduction of these regulations around coronavirus and the guidance uh, that's contained. Even the look around us, the democratic process has even been compromised to a degree that only so many of us can be in this chamber at a time to, to exercise the democratic process. We've all made sacrifices around the education of our children and our grandchildren. People of, of faith have made sacrifices around their ability to join in public worship. Uh, families have made sacrifices around uh, family uh, gatherings. And one of the big things is we've all made sacrifices around not being able to visit relatives, family members who are in hospital or who are in nursing homes or care homes. Those are all huge sacrifices that we've all uh, had to make. But the one sacrifice that really, in my opinion, trumps them all is the sacrifice that we've had to make around uh, our attendance, or lack of attendance, at funerals of friends. And certainly, I think the last funeral of a friend that I attended was maybe two and a half months ago. And a lot of my friends have, been, have died in the meantime and have been buried. And you don't know where they're buried. You don't know when they were buried because of the restrictions around the number of people that can attend uh, the funeral. And I think it's, uh, we have to recognize, I think uh, uh, Mr. Beatty alluded to it, that these restrictions, particularly around funerals, they're not directed at any one section of the community, either on the basis of religion or of political uh, positions. They are regulations that have affected every home uh, throughout Northern Ireland. And these regulations, they're not in place uh, and they haven't been put in place by the executive for fun. Uh, they're there for a reason, and that reason is to protect us all and to stop the spread of this dreadful um, virus. And we've had instances over uh, recent weeks where we've seen irresponsible behavior around gatherings on beaches, uh, thankfully, nothing like what we witnessed maybe in the south coast of England uh, during the good weather. But we have had large gatherings, particularly of young people, on beaches. And we've had protest meetings, gatherings uh, to protest about various issues. And really, I think we all accept that those uh, sort of gatherings are all ill-advised. And the junior minister, in his opening remarks, talked about fines alone are not the answer. Of course they're not the answer. We all have a civic responsibility to exercise uh, the regulations and the guidance uh, that's given. We have a responsibility 
to show civic leadership. I spoke last week on the day of the funeral that has been in the news in recent days. And when I spoke, I didn't have any knowledge of any of the circumstances around that funeral or what was happening. Uh, uh, subsequently, we heard at Roselawn uh, Crematorium. But I told a story, and I'm, I'm going to repeat it, of a neighbour whose husband had served in a uniform organisation of the state. Um, he was a long-serving member. There would have been an expectation, I would have thought, at his funeral that his cortege would contain colleagues from that uniform organisation, and no doubt they would have carried his coffin uh, with pride. That lady followed the hearse from a funeral home where they had a short service and stopped in the middle of the road not far from where I live. And that lady had to say her goodbyes to her husband of some, I think it's nearly 60 years she was married. And it was quite poignant. She had to kiss the window of the hearse. That was her goodbye to her husband as his body then was taken to Roseland for uh, cremation. She had to do that. She had to make that farewell in the middle of a public street with traffic flowing past her and people walking up and down the street. Not a terribly dignified way for anybody to say goodbye to uh, a loved one. But that lady made that sacrifice. That was about two weeks ago. And I'm sure last Tuesday, when she saw the news and heard about all that went on at the crematorium, uh, I, I, I couldn't start to imagine what her, her feelings uh, would be. Uh, I'm sure it would be sadness, disappointment, but I'm sure also anger. And you, you would, I can understand the anger. I'm only talking about one lady, one family. We all know families that have made the same sacrifices. Dozens, dozens, dozens hundreds of families who have made that sacrifice over uh, funerals, uh, over recent uh, weeks. And um, I've had dozens of emails uh, from people over the weekend asking me for an explanation as a public representative to, to comment on it. And I really don't know what to say to people. Um, I mean, I have respect for this house. I have respect for the executive. I support the executive. Um, I've been a cheerleader uh, for all the regulations, which I think is, is, is a responsibility of us all in this chamber to be cheerleaders for things that are going to protect life and limb. And I know that the the chief medical officer, the chief scientific officer, did say at a meeting of the health committee that he had walked into his shop with his face mask on, and he was surprised that people in the shop didn't have face masks on. Now, I think he may have been referring to the close proximity of people in a confined space inside a, a, a shop. Uh, I'm not sure that he was indicating that he wears his face mask when he walks up and down the street. And I think really, um, you know, the, the face mask can give you a degree uh, of mitigation against the transmission of this disease. But I think that the greatest mitigation that there is to prevent the transmission of this virus is to avoid large gatherings. And I think that the events of last Tuesday, which we will debate at length tomorrow, uh, were totally ill-advised, disappointing that members of this House, members of our executive, saw fit to attend that and couldn't make the sacrifice. I've heard about I couldn't not attend the funeral of a friend. 
I could say that 20, 30 times over. Over the last couple of months, I could not attend the funeral of a friend. What makes those people who are saying that they could, they had to attend the funeral of a friend, what gives them the moral right to take that position? And I can understand, I can understand colleagues in this house who would want to be at that funeral last Tuesday. I totally get it. And if there wasn't a pandemic, I would have no quarrel with hundreds of people going to it and doing all that you do at that type of funeral. I would have no difficulty with it. But we are in the middle, still in the middle of a pandemic, which we're all trying to fight. And let's be under no illusions. Another surge of this could come back and take many more lives of our citizens. We all have a responsibility to do what we can to ensure that that doesn't happen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. This is something of a sham debate because we're debating regulations made by an executive when that executive collectively does not believe in, regu in regulations in some respects. And the sham is further underscored by the fact that this debate will be responded to on behalf of the executive by Junior Minister Kearney, who this time last, uh, who last Tuesday, when he last debated these matters, when he ought to have been here to move or to answer, chose instead to himself breach the regulations by attending a funeral of a person of her, whom he was neither a household member nor a relative, when the regulations were abundantly clear in Regulation 52G that no person who was not of the same household or a relative should be attending any funeral. Deputy Minister Kearney, with his cohorts, decided that law wasn't for him. And yet today, in the display of incredible hypocrisy, this House will be treated to a junior minister responding to this debate in respect of regulations which he himself does not honour. How low can this place sink? That's why I said it is a sham, a fundamental of the contract between government and the governed is that the government that makes the laws keeps the laws before they expect the people for whom they are also made to keep them. And yet here we have a situation where we have ministers in this executive who sit round the executive table making these laws. Then, when the opportunity requires it, frequently breaches them. Where is the loyalty? Where is the collective responsibility? Of course, the answer is that there is a greater loyalty when it comes to Sinn Féin members of this executive. The greater loyalty is not to the executive or to any system of government. The greater loyalty is the fidelity to the Republican movement to show homage to the gruesome heroes of that movement. That's the greater loyalty that trumps obeying their own laws. And that's what we saw last Tuesday. We saw ministers 
openly, unapologetically, demanding of everyone else loyalty to law, but themselves setting themselves above the law. These are ministers who took a pledge of office, which included an obligation to support the rule of law unequivocally in word and deed. Unequivocally in word and deed. Last Tuesday, we saw the deeds in flagrant breach of the very rule of law that applied at that time to funerals. Why was that? Say it again. They told us no exemptions except when fidelity to the Republican cause demands homage to people such as Mr. Story. Then that trumps everything. That's what we saw last week. And unequivocally in word, well, of course, we then, in addition to the sham situation of this debate, had the sham apology. We had Michelle O'Neill, effectively joint first minister in this part of the United Kingdom, saying, I'm sorry if people were hurt, but I didn't cause it. What a sham of an apology. And then, of course, lest anyone is in any doubt, she copper fastens it by saying, and I will never apologize. So much for saying sorry about anything. When you immediately take any shred of contrition, of which there was none to start with, and underscore it by saying, I will never apologize for attending the funeral of a friend. And what was she saying? She was saying, whatever about my pledge of office, whatever about unequivocally by word and deed, supporting the rule of law, there is a greater loyalty that she has. And that is to the Republican movement. And that is the Achilles heel, in fact, it's far more, of this executive and this assembly. We're now in a situation where the credibility has been shredded by itself, by, a, by an integral part of the executive. And all the executive parties can say is, we're very disappointed. That's what they're going to tell us tomorrow in a motion. We're very disappointed. No condemnation. No demand for resignations. Isn't it disappointing? How pathetic. And then, today, no doubt, we'll be treated in the wind-up to a recitation of all sorts of weasel words. Reality remains. This, an executive, this is an executive populated on the Sinn Féin side by ministers who believe themselves to be above the law, the very law they seek, they make. I can't imagine a more shattering position for any government to be in than those who make its laws, then set themselves up above those laws. And then come to this house with the pretense that they need to have this house approve regulations, which when it suits, some will not even obey. What a sham, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The other, deputy, the other junior minister, Mr. Lyons, uh, told us 
that about other amendments that have since been made. One of them is Amendment 9. Amendment 9 was made at 9.30 on Monday evening last. What did Amendment 9 do? It allowed, instead of 10, 30 people to participate in an outside gathering. When did it come into effect? Well, you might have thought it could have been laid in this house before it came into effect. Oh, no. It came into effect 90 minutes later, at 11 o'clock last Monday night, before it was even laid in this house. Never mind debate it. Why was that? Well, maybe we have the, exa- maybe we have the answer in the utterly bogus excuse proffered by Sinn Féin as to their justification for being at this funeral. When they sought to self-isolate the cortege from the funeral, when they sought to suggest the cortege was only 30, even though they'd elbowed family members out of it so as they could be there themselves to keep it at 30, the cortege was only 30, therefore they didn't break the law. Utterly bogus, totally spurious. Regulation 5.2G is emphatic in its terms. But is that why Amendment 9 was made at great haste and published at great haste late into last Monday evening so as to provide a fig leaf to Sinn Féin? Were the DUP complicit in that? Did they not see what was happening? That the very next day, a gruesome hero of republicanism was to be buried? Did they fall blindly, or not so blindly, into the trap of providing a fig leaf for Sinn Féin? Even though that's all it is. It's utterly bogus. Does not exculpate them from the breach of the law. And I think the public, who have been watching on in amazement, will want to know what was the haste, what was the urgency the statute requires to make that amendment before it could even be laid in this house. It's not the first one that's been made without being laid, I grant you that. But it is the one made. I believe, in the shortest timescale with the most obvious political ramifications. So, many questions. Could I come to an issue, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, about marriages? I raised it many times. I raised it last Tuesday about indoor weddings and the fact that today, still, indoor weddings are prohibited. Yet, from today, you can have an indoor piercing carried out. So you can have a ring put through your nose, but you can't have a ring put in your finger indoors. What sort of logic is governing the executive's timescale in this? And I do make further plea. Why, oh why? If you can have religious services, if you can have funerals, if you can have Bible readings, if you can have all the, and all those things, and we saw many of them yesterday across this province, why can you not have an indoor wedding? Really, it's time the executive dealt with that. Trust the will. Thank you. I call. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's very concerning again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we're being asked to make amendments to coronavirus regulations without any clear, focused, or detailed scientific rationale or medical evidence for doing so. It's something I have repeatedly raised on the Health Committee, and I do so again today with concern. Uh, the Health Minister himself uh, at the Health Committee stated that the virus hasn't uh, went away, and indeed it hasn't, and I, alongside many others, 
are worried that the executive is moving too fast to lift restrictions. And we hear repeated pleas from scientists uh, about this, uh, about this measures and these measures being implemented far too quick. I think we need to listen to those concerns. Um, and if there is uh, medical evidence, a uh, scientific basis to the actions, surely it would be provided uh, to the public and to us in the House. And the truth is, Mr Deputy Speaker, this executive and the Tories moved too slowly to enact the lockdown in March because it prioritised economic concerns and profit rates over health concerns. Now we see the situation in reverse as the executive moves to lift lockdown hastily in order to appease similar economic interests. And I'm concerned that this executive has moved uh, to lift restrictions such as some of those outlined in Amendment 8, not because we are reaching near elimination levels uh, of the virus on this island, but because they are being seemingly leaned on and lobbied by business interests above all else. And we often hear, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the economy and the need to protect the economy in this debate. <clears throat> but we have to remember that the economy does not exist on abstract notions or theories, but on the actual activity uh, and labour of working people. Without workers, there is no economy to speak of. And one thing this pandemic has shown is that chief executives and corporate bosses are nothing without the skills and labour of the people who are often paid very little. And those people who are often uh, not paid well should not be forced back to work en masse when there are still concerns over their safety and the virus more generally. It's worth saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we, um, we were already, by many accounts, headed uh, to, uh, towards a recession before this crisis, although admittedly not as deep as the one uh, we are told will come. Recession isn't inevitable, though. It's due to capitalist economics, and we need to move away from this way uh, of society being run and systems based on addiction to growth and accumulation of wealth in the hands of a tiny elite are a health risk uh, to many and need to be dismantled if we are to avoid uh, economic ruin, climate disaster and many other uh, problems. Uh, economic competition, Mr Deputy Speaker, seems to be driving the bulk of these decisions in relation to the coronavirus response. Once a decision is made in the south, then it appears to be scrambling goes on to make a similar decision in the north. I think there has to be a clear attempt to try and get um, there is a, a clear attempt rather to try and get the last of the consumer spend of the summer with the changes to these and other regulations. And we have to prioritise health concerns should come before all else. To be crystal clear, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have no issue with people uh, visiting uh, family uh, safely. It's worth saying that people have went months uh, without doing that, without seeing their loved ones, uh, and as people have already said, their mental health being impacted. So I have no real issue with Amendment Number Seven. Then, but there is a, a clear question of autonomy with these decisions. That is, people can take it upon themselves to go and visit uh, their family members after weighing up their own risks potentially, uh, taking into account the, the guidance. Uh, but people um, have a choice whether to do that uh, or not. But workers who are being forced back into work do not have that free choice. They cannot make that same choice. And it is deeply concerning that with the furlough scheme still in existence, that workers are being forced to return to work in such large numbers, particularly in the hospitality industry. And I've made my concerns clear about this on the Health Committee, and although I can't force a division seemingly um, on the House today, as, as I'm in a minority, uh, for the record, on Hansard at least, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to repeat my view that I did not support uh, the opening of bars and other outlets so soon and with such haste. And in that regard, I want to pay tribute to all those people who have been raising health and safety concerns, in particular uh, Unite Hospitality Branch, who have been raising concerns after concerns uh, after bars and, and restaurants and hospitality sector has opened. And I would encourage anybody working in those sectors to join Unite and join other trade unions to protect themselves uh, and their colleagues at this time. We all know, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, of the potentiality of a second wave and the possibility of clusters and workplaces. If they do arise and we have a situation like has emerged in Leicester, then the executive will have some serious questions to answer in this regard. This is an issue of utmost severity. And in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have a few questions for the Justice Minister uh, to answer. Can the Minister give some indication how the Executive plans to oversee and inspect this uh, in relation to bars and restaurants reopening? I mean, bars may function well, and it appears to be, by most accounts, they did uh, at the weekend in Belfast, at least. But as the days go on, and when profit motive comes into it and more alcohol starts to flow, are people seriously confident that social distancing will be adhered to? 
Uh, will there be an inspection plan in place? Or does the executive just plan to sit and hope and wait and see and respond if the R rate raises and then respond? We need some clarity and clear answers on these fundamental and important questions. We know that vulnerable people were failed at the start of this pandemic with inspections that didn't, place, uh, didn't take place in any real sense in care homes. So if the executive failed elderly and vulnerable people, where is the confidence that the actions of people who may be healthy and who may not have underlying health conditions will be inspected, people in bars and people in restaurants? So the public and those working in hospitality, Mr Deputy Speaker, need clear answers to those questions, and I would uh, like the junior minister to uh, provide those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Carroll. No other member has indicated to me that they wish to speak in this debate, so I call the junior minister, Declan Kearney, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome today's debate and I thank the members for their contributions and their views. Our five party power sharing government has been committed to working in partnership with all sectors of society extending through business, faith, community leaders, our sports organisations and others, as we have sought to provide leadership, clarity and decision making during this very challenging time. All of the decisions, as I have explained to the House in the past, on relation to lifting restrictions have been made with careful consideration and with clear reference to three broad criteria, community well-being and public health, developing a pathway to economic and social recovery and ensuring at all times the resilience of our health and social care system. The Joint Heads of Government published a roadmap of relaxations matched to indicative dates from now through until the end of August and this has been discussed at length both in committee and here in the chamber. And this timetable makes it clear what the coming weeks look like and how we can move back from August through the succeeding weeks. We all want to see a return to a more normal way of living. But the reality is what we have now is the development of a new normal. We need to learn to live with the virus at least for some time to come because as other speakers have pointed out in this debate and in previous, coronavirus, COVID-19 remains within our midst. A free vlias can call you, but while you're on the air, you are in Gisbrock the Nish. Principal Deputy Speaker, I would like now to turn to some of the points that members have made during this debate today. And I will try to touch on most of the key issues. I'll focus in particular on those aspects relevant to the amendment regulations at the centre of the debate. Colin McGrath spoke first and uh, he addressed the House initially as the chair of the Executive Office Committee and he emphasised the need for compliance by everyone. He thanked our society for continued sacrifice and impressed in his contribution, the need for common purpose to be shared. I agree with him on the importance of a recovery strategy and the need for an intensive engagement with civic society on that strategy, because that and a coordinated approach is the key to a successful delivery. And I welcome his recognition of the many sacrifices that have been made by so many of our fellow citizens and the key workers who have held the front line against COVID-19, because they have indeed saved lives. Colm Gildernew spoke next and he set out how his committee, the Health Committee, dealt with the approach of the committee in relation to these particular amendments. And uh, I will ensure that the officials address the omission to which he referred, the, uh, the publication of the scientific advice provided to it is to inform the collective decisions. And that, of course, is something that needs to be taken forward by the executive for consideration alongside all of our committees, which exist to perform democratic scrutiny of all legislation and regulations. Pam Cameron welcomed the easements process to date to assist in getting business back to work. She addressed the needs 
of children, and she also highlighted the importance of churches and places of worship once more being opened. She made the point that these relaxations bring welcome relief to the hard-pressed hospitality sector and that they do indeed bring undoubted benefits in mental health terms, in terms of how we can all seek to get back to that form of new normality, specifically through being able to access places of worship, acts of worship, for families being able to meet together in however limited terms, and also being able to visit holiday homes. And welcome the very positive engagement with church leaders, which myself and Minister Lyons have been directly involved in, and the positive leadership that our church leaders have been providing throughout this period. And she also uh, delivered a criticism of Sinn Féin members of the House. Doug Beatty spoke next, and in his contribution, the member rightly referred to the need for the restrictions and the cost of the restrictions to be fully recognised in terms of our economy, to the normalisation of social life, and for the mental and the physical health and well-being of our citizens. I welcome the fact that these regulations do allow us to make real progress on the path back to normality, and Doug Beatty indicated that he sees the, uh, the trajectory opening up on that basis. But on the particular concerns which he raised and spoke at some length on. There will be more to be said on all of those issues, as you've said yourself, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, on another day. But I do recognise the profound and the enduring hurt felt by all of those who have experienced a bereavement as a result of this pandemic and of those who have been unable to grieve as they would have wished. And I acknowledge and deeply regret the hurt that they do and must feel. Paula, no, Mr. Alistair, I won't. Paula, Paula Brad, Bradshaw spoke next, and she highlighted the difficulties faced by local businesses and the prospect of some businesses, even as we move through our recovery, facing the, uh, the real prospect of overall closure. She raised the issue of masking, suggested that uh, the wearing of masks is likely to become a very important confidence-building measure in the time ahead, and repeated a concern that she has raised before about the delay in notifications of how we move through uh, the lifting of restrictions for the public. Pat Sheehan spoke then, and uh, I agree with the member on the importance of the role of grandparents and the value of intergenerational care and family life that is such a, a feature and a distinct characteristic of our own society. I do agree with him that we must recognise the sacrifices that so many people continue to make in having to work with the adaption or the adjustment to uncomfortable PPE or the repurposing or the reconfiguring of businesses so that their services continue to be provided. It is very arduous and I do welcome and I appreciate with significant gratitude the manner, the manner, the manner in which those businesses are seeking to adapt. Yes, go ahead, please. Mr. Minister, uh, Mr. Sheehan talked about and expressed concern about the rise in the R number uh, in London, and it is cause for concern. But would the Minister agree that what is more relevant to this House is the local R figure and what we all should be doing to help to keep it low? Thank you. Yes, I do agree with the member. Our focus needs to be on the region and ensuring that we uh, maximise, minimise the development of the R number and, and, and keep a very close focus on all of the other indicators which provide our medical and our scientific advisors with the data allowing them to provide us with advice. But returning to, uh, to Pat Sheehan and his comments in relation to face coverings, I, I thank him for highlighting along with Paula Bradshaw, that it is strongly recommended that members of the public should in fact use face coverings in enclosed spaces where social distancing in particular is not possible for short periods. And these circumstances will include, will extend to public transport and in shops and other retail environments, but also in circumstances where we find ourselves visiting with family or friends indoors and indeed 
in uh, healthcare settings. Yes? Thank the Junior Minister for giving way. Um, just on the issue of uh, wearing face coverings, and I'm not opposed to that in, in any circumstance, if it, if it helps in combating the virus. But would the Junior Minister like to inform us whether he wore a mask when he attended the funeral, or did his colleagues wear a mask for that funeral when there was no social distancing in place, whether indoors or outdoors? Well, on that particular matter, yes, I did, and habitually I will wear a face mask when I'm doing the shopping and when I find myself in uh, circumstances where it's difficult to socially distance in shops, shopping centres and so on. Uh, in relation to uh, Robbie Butler's contribution, which came next, he spoke of the pressures pre-COVID on our health and social care system, and he emphasised, uh, importantly, uh, the significance of local shopping, but also being able to uh, locally shop and to do so safely. And of course, there's a, there's a, there's a linkage in relation to potentially the use of uh, face coverings in, in that particular respect. But I do agree strongly with the members' remarks about the importance of social and family life, and also the, the, the real dangers of indefinite social distancing and the difficulties that that co causes, not just for older people, but also for some of our young people, and most especially those in our society who live with special needs. I agree strongly that as we emerge from the pandemic, we must not lose sight of that important issue of mental health and well-being. John Blair then spoke and uh, stressed the difficulty of a one-size-fits-all approach being taken in relation to how we move forward in relation to recovery. And he uh, specifically highlighted that as an issue in relation to rural areas. And he pointed to the need of addressing licensing and planning issues, particularly in a rural context. And, and I fully agree with the member in that particular matter. We share a constituency and very significant parts of that constituency are rural in and of themselves. Alan Chambers then spoke, and he reminded us that these amendments and the lifting of restrictions are only part of a journey. He spoke about the level of sacrifice which we have all experienced throughout this period, and he stressed the vital importance of civic leadership being demonstrated. And he also uh, very poignantly recalled uh, the personal grief of friends and neighbours close to him and in his uh, own area during this period. The final speaker in the debate, uh, Afriv Yaskyong Korya, was uh, Jim Allister. And uh, he chose to make a personalised attack upon myself and to describe this debate as a sham. He repeated his concern about the facilitation of indoor funerals. But I can assure the member uh, that that particular issue is going to be addressed by the executive presently. And no, I won't, Mr. Allister. And sorry, I, I, I misdescribed Mr. Allister as the final speaker. The final speaker of the debate, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, was Mr. Jerry Carroll, who stated that the executive is moving much too quickly. He feels that uh, the easements and the relaxations are coming at a pace. And specifically, he disagreed with uh, elements in relation to Amendment 8 and feels, in his view, that uh, this kind of amendment and the restrictions being lifted are principally being influenced as a result of the influence of business interests. And uh, he expressed his own lack of confidence that appropriate inspections will be carried out in a number of the settings which will now be allowed to go back to business as a result of the listing of restrictions. And, and I can assure the member that in the same manner that the executive has worked with other appropriate agencies uh, throughout this period to try and ensure that we have safer uh, workplaces, that that practice will extend to the new workplaces which are reopening and providing services uh, as we move through this phase of recovery. Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, allow me to say this. I, I too have listened to the voices of those who have lost loved ones. And no family's grief is any more important than any other family. 
I am also deeply concerned that those grieving families are experiencing right across our community more hurt over recent days, and I am sorry that that is the case. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, for those members whose points I have not addressed in, uh, in, in, in this debate, and, and, and I think I have, but in the event that I've left any particular issue out, let me assure those members that I will respond in writing and direct officials to do so. In conclusion, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, notwithstanding the erroneous and direct criticism of me personally, I will continue to act with integrity to observe the ministerial pledge and code, and, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, to act in the interests of all citizens living within our society, to uphold the basis of the Good Friday Agreement and the operation of our power-sharing government and our political process going forward. A free flash concordia, Mala Munroon, Agus Narelaha, Don Chono, I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Gurumaigat, thank you. Point of order, A point of order, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, is it in order for members sitting in a, a sedentary position to be grunting in the chamber? I think uh, I'll address Mr. Sheehan first, and then I'll take your point of order, Mr. Alistair. The, the guidance around the conduct of the House is generally clear, and I think all members know this, that debates should be temperate and people should be respectful towards each other. So in answer to your question, I think sustained heckling is not appropriate. I think um, <laughs> grunting, I think, was the phrase you used. Um, from the chair when I'm in the chair, I'll allow a little grunting, but not sustained heckling, I think is probably the best way of putting it. <laughs> sustained grunting is a different issue. Uh, Mr. Alistair. Just for the avoidance of doubt, I was expressing utter disbelief in the affirmations and the obfuscations of the junior minister. And is it in order for a junior minister to come to this house and engage in weasel words and obfuscations on an issue such as this? It's not uh, weasel words are the terms that you have used. They're not defined in standing orders. Uh, people can uh, take exception to answers that are given. But the answers that the minister gives are the answers that the minister gives. And there's ample opportunity for members to cross-examine ministers uh, on the floor of this House. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 7 regulations be approved. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Members, before we start the next item of business, I would like to advise you that an urgent oral question will be taken at the end of executive business today. This is at the conclusion of the second stage of the executive committee functions bill. If members could just take their ease for a moment. Oh, I beg your pardon, the second regulation. I'm terribly sorry, Minister. We now move on to the motion on the health protection coronavirus. Amendment number eight regulations, which has already been debated, uh, I ask the clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment number eight regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. Could I call Junior Minister Kearney to move? Yes, I move. Thank you. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 8 Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. If members could please just take their ease for a moment while we change the top table. Thank you.